Finn, welcome to the Strength Running Podcast. Jason, it's great to be here. We were just talking offline a moment ago. You were one of the first guests on my show, the Single Track Podcast, and you were excellent. And I learned a ton, and I'm I'm sure our our listenership learned a ton. So it's it's great to be here, and hopefully, I can provide half as much value. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. That was years ago, right? How many years ago was that? It would have been October 2021. So we're coming up on two years in the fall. Seems like just yesterday. Um, well, we have a lot to talk about today, and I'm excited that you're here because you are so uh, involved and enmeshed in the ultra and trail running world. And we're recording this about three days after Western States. So I think we have to start with Western States, don't you think? I mean, what a weekend. Incredible weekend. It's one of the two or three times in the calendar year, in my opinion, in the United States where more than just super fans have eyeballs on the sport. I think a lot of star power helps that. So people like Courtney DeWalter who have transcended the sport bring in a large audience. And not only does someone like Courtney bring in a large audience, but then when the audience is there and everyone's watching, she registers what some people, probably the majority of people are calling the greatest run in the history of our sport. Yeah, it's super impressive. Um, that leads me to ask you, what are some of the other times when, you know, more than just super fans tune into the sport? I, I am thinking you might say the Boston Marathon, but what are some of those other times? In the trail running space, for the ultra trail scene, it's pretty much the Western States 100 and then the ultra trail du Mont Blanc week that typically takes place the last week of August, the first week of September every year. If I look at my metrics in my, my podcast caters pretty narrowly to an ultra trail running audience, those are the two times each year that I grow the most. It's when casual observers jump in. So it's pretty limited. There are a couple events that I see gaining steam. So for example, in Innsbruck, Austria, earlier this month in June, there were the 80K Trail World Championships, also the vertical race, the classic race, et cetera. And we saw for the first time, not the first time, but a, f a more more media attention on that race than usual and um, that gave me a lot of confidence that we're still going to maintain in the future this emphasis on states and UTMB but also adding more events to the rotation because uh, yeah I, one of the great challenges in our sport is how do you bring people in that don't necessarily participate but are interested in observing a lot of other sports have that baseball basketball football a lot of people don't play but watch and even though running is this mass participation sport, it might be the most popular sport in the, in the country, just based on pop participation, for whatever reason, there's a massive drop off in terms of fans. And we have to fix that. Yeah, we do. And, and I think p part of the solution, and we're certainly gonna get into this a little bit later, I, I kind of wanna talk a little bit more about Western States because it was such an exciting weekend. I think part of that is star power and runners who transcend the sport. You know, you mentioned Courtney DeWalter. You know, I saw her on Cameron Haynes' YouTube show, Run, Lift, Shoot, where, yeah. you know, they're doing some, some gnarly stuff. And it's just so cool seeing a professional ultra runner transcend and, and get into some of these other media spaces where she can reach a whole new audience. Um, you know, and her performance this past weekend was just <laughs> insane. I mean, she, I think she absolutely crushed the course record by over an hour. She ran faster than many of the male greats over the last decade. Yeah. Um, I know you did a pre-race interview with her. Did you pick up on any, any hints of what she was about to do from that conversation? Because, you know, th like you said, this is maybe one of the greatest running performances in history. And I like, did you see it coming? Like you talked to her beforehand. Yeah, I think you had to assume she was going for it. Just based on her track record in the sport, she has been on this tear the last six or seven years where every time she steps up to the plate at one of the most important races in the sport, if she doesn't get it the first time, she gets it the second time around. She's done it at the Hard Rock 100, another notable race here in the U.S. She did it at Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc. She got into the overall top 10 in that race back in, I believe, 2021. She's won the Western States 100 before back in 2018. So one of the only reasons why I think she came back 
was to get this course record. She said in our pre-race interview that, you know, the last time she was here, uh, she had to DNF the race at mile 80 because she had this hip issue and, you know, she wanted to run those final 20 miles from Green Gate to the Placer High track. But I, I do think the course record was probably on her mind. That said, she is mysterious in a lot of ways. You know, she's not, she does not tend to disclose her training. I, I know when you talk with a lot of athletes, they'll run you through the numbers of weekly vert, time on feet, mileage, the workouts they're doing. A lot of people have, you know, they keep their Strava files public. Courtney is, is somewhat of a black box in that regard. It's, it's hard to know exactly what she's doing in training. She keeps her Strava private. We asked her in our pre-race interview, you know, what went into the buildup for Western States? You know, what kind of wor workouts were you doing? Weekly mileage? How were you preparing? And she said simply, I'm running a lot and, <laughs> and left it at that and, and sort of led us to the next question. So I think that's part of what makes Courtney so cool is she has this incredibly friendly and self-deprecating and approachable, relatable demeanor. And she's not that interested in, you know, talking X's and O's, which I think is really, is cool in a way. Like she, she definitely loves to talk about the mental aspects of the sport. Like she has her famous pain cave uh, description of, you know, when she gets into like mile 60 or 70 or 80 of these races and she needs to work through, you know, all of these thought processes to, to keep it going, but does not divulge much to uh, folks, perhaps like you and I, who would love to know, you know, what are you doing over there in Leadville, Colorado to break this course record by over an hour? And, and like you mentioned with that, that meme that's been floating around Twitter, she's run a faster time there than Killian Jornet has, than, than Dylan Bowman has, than Ian Sharman has, Jeff Browning, a lot of the greats in our sport. Scott Jurek. Scott Jurek has won that race six or seven times, and he never ran anywhere close to the time she ran. I think she's run 20 minutes or 30 minutes faster than he ever did there. So it is an historic run. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really just incredible to think about. I mean, if, if you, we were to put this in perspective, it would be like her running kind of like a 350 or 355 marathon four times in a row. With elevation it, change. With elevation change, with a lot of, um, you know, the, she is at altitude. There is some altitude at Western States. There's also the fact that, you know, this isn't a road race. You're not running on the road where you're getting all that energy return. You don't have to worry about your footsteps. I mean, it's a whole different ball game. And to do that back to back to back to back is just mind blowing. And I, I just hope folks truly appreciate the gravity of this performance because it, it's, it's almost a little bit unbelievable. So, Finn, I want to ask you a big, broad, loaded question that's going to be difficult for you to answer. <laughs> what is happening right now in the world of ultra trail running? Something is going on. The sport is having a moment, whether we're talking about incredible performances or more participation or more interest and in coverage of the sport. You know, the sport is really experiencing quite the moment right now. You know, from a, from a high-level perspective, what do you think is happening right now in the sport of mountain and ultra trail running? I think it's the confluence of a lot of factors. I think it's a lot of right people at the right place at the right time. So I think trail running, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, has been fortunate to have people that are very interested in storytelling and relaying a lot of their experiences back to the masses you know people like billy yang come to mind you know no one no one told billy yang hey start making all of these go through the trouble without any sponsors of making all of these great movies that are super relatable and they display these amazing inspiring performances and these courses and all of these trials and tribulations of the human condition no one was telling billy or incentivizing billy to go do that he just felt compelled from the bottom of his heart to go and make that stuff. So I think there's a lot of that going on, just like these super generous and inspired people taking it upon themselves and using their talents to, to kind of spread the gospel about the sport. I think also when you have a sport like trail running or ultra running, because it, it started out with kind of humble origins, because it's a smaller sport, people that are interested in the media side of it, are always looking to the frontier of what's possible. So like new channels, new tactics, new techniques, the latest and greatest in, in storytelling capabilities. They're trying, they're, they're searching far and wide to find those things. 
and because they're sort of coming from behind and they're, they're underdogs, we are underdogs in all of this, uh, similar to like pickleball becoming this like, you know, nationwide phenomenon with like a major league sport, you know, infrastructure around it. I think because of the nature of trail and ultra running and where it's at, people just want to, or people are more open to trying and testing everything to, to get it out there to a mass audience. Yeah, there's 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 so much going on. I, I can't help but think that technology is also helping the sport of of trail running become more popular. You know, everything with, uh, you know, you mentioned different mediums and platforms for getting the word out and just sort of telling these stories about the sport. What role do you think technology has played in the growth of trail running? Because I, I think it's an interesting question because it's like trail running is this very simple sort of um you know, rustic sport almost, you know, with me living in Denver, I, I go up into the mountains all the time and, and there's a strong trail running scene in, in the Denver Boulder area. And, and a lot of these runners, you know, they live for these weekend mountain adventures where they're just out in some of the most beautiful trail running environments that you can find in the country. And it's almost like it's an escape from technology. And so, you know, it's like this double-edged sword. Like we're trying to get away from it in a certain sense and just experience nature and just have these moments of awe and beauty while at the same time relying on technology to grow the sport, to communicate more about the sport and tell these really interesting stories. I think you cannot decouple advances in technology from the story about the growth of trail and ultra running. You look at companies like Era Viper Running, for folks that aren't familiar, Era Viper Running is this is probably the largest ultra running events company in the American West, maybe in the entire US. You'd have to fact check me on that, but they, they were early pioneers in live stream technology and throwing a live stream against races like the Black Canyon 100K, the Cocodona 250. You're, you've seen Western states, which we just talked about at the beginning of this conversation, they adopted live stream technology back in 2021. This was the third year uh, of their product going out to the masses. I think it reached, I just looked before this episode, I think the first part one of their live stream, the first 10 hours of the live stream reached 145,000 unique viewers, which I think was a significant jump, maybe a 2X jump from last year's live stream. So you're seeing more adoption of you know viewing these races as the technology gets better i think the only issue right now is just it's still early days in terms of technology and there are limitations out there so for example on the western states course even with starlinks it's hard to put together shots that don't have a lot of late latency in them among other issues i think as soon as we finish those sort of last mile broadband efforts in the most rural parts of the u.s i think it's going to kind of be, I don't want to say like game over, but it's going to put trail running on an even larger pedestal, at least within the running community, because when you combine the personalities in our sport with the, the awe-inspiring geography and then seamless viewing experience, I mean, we've already seen audiences come to these live streams when, you know, the camera views are super grainy, there's pauses, the announcers are speaking into the ether because, you know, one of the Starlinks or the drone operators cameras are down and there's still people that are compelled to watch. So I think five years from now, 10 years from now, partly because of the early adoption, but also because of improving technology, we're going to see step functions of growth that uh, maybe non trail running audiences couldn't imagine. That to me is just so exciting. And I, I sort of just want to fast forward, you know, five or 10 years and, and be able to witness some of this amazing coverage. Um, I, I do want to drill down into this a little bit more because I feel like all of us have sort of become live streamers because we all have this wonderful piece of technology in our pocket, the smartphone, and we can yeah. live stream on Instagram. You know, there's been Facebook live streams around for, for more than five years at this point. Is it simply an internet connectivity issue that prevents uh, the live streaming from some of these more remote ultra marathons? Because I admittedly don't really understand the technology and, and what goes into creating a, a live 
sport event that is essentially, you know, a hundred miles of trail. You know, you're, it's not like you're on a basketball court or you're on a soccer field and you only have to worry about this relatively small uh, avenue of, or, or a platform of play for the sport. It's, it's over a hundred miles and, and you yeah. have to have people, you know, running sometimes with the athletes. Like it's a whole different ball game here. Uh, can you just go into some of the specifics there and, and maybe what is currently holding back some of this technology for, from giving us a viewing experience that we would all probably want? With the caveat that I don't operate in the most techno technological regions of this experience, like my live stream experience is mostly contained to the commentary side of things. Like I've commentated for the Black Canyon races, Cocodona did a little bit at Western States with our own single track crew setting up Starlinks and stuff like that. The primary barrier from what I understand is just simply broadband connection. So like access to 5G internet speeds. One thing I would encourage for folks that are interested in seeing the comparison, I would encourage them to go check out the live streams for the 2022 UTMB over in Chamonix, France, or even most recently the 2023 80k trail world championships over in Innsbruck, Austria. One thing, one advantage that those European races have over American races is mountain culture is much more tightly embedded into the rest of mainstream society. A lot of these cities and towns are built right into the mountains, so they have cell towers everywhere. It's you're not you don't really have this escape from technology whereas in the western US for example, there's a lot of remote locations in, especially on the western states course. And so we, we've definitely seen pretty significant improvements from year one of the Western State stream to now, but I, th I still think these American live streams have some are operating at somewhat of a disadvantage purely because of the infrastructure in this country around broadband. Yeah, and, and my understanding is that we actually approved a whole bunch of money to improve broadband access in rural areas, either last year or this year through Congress or something like that. So. Cool. Hopefully, this means that whatever Congress is doing may actually trickle down to help the sport of trail running. Who would have known? But uh, that's something I'm excited about. I live here in Salt Lake City, and I've lived here for the past seven years, you know, recreated a ton in the central Wasatch Range. And I remember even five years ago, there was almost no cell phone coverage in places like Mill Creek Canyon or parts of Big Cottonwood Canyon, which, you know, are just famous trail running spots and now like full bar, you know? So I, I do hope and anticipate that, that things will change fairly dramatically again in, in the next like five to 10 year window. And I'm very excited because I think that's one of, that's probably the biggest bottleneck. I mean, I know you've had Dylan Bowman on the podcast, for example, Dylan and Corinne are excellent commentators and their, their part of the product is already amazing. And really the last mile effort is just improving like the frames. And, and, and the viewing experience and some of the drone shots and, you know, the, the sideline reporters coming in from remote aid stations to provide an update on one of the top runners that's like sitting in a chair, getting nice down or thinking about quitting, stuff like that. Yeah, I think the opportunity for even better coverage as soon as you can, you know, get the cameras in there and really show the, the, the drama of the race is just going to be really exciting. Um, I'd love to rewind the clock a little bit and compare the sport of trail running in 2023 to the sport of trail running like a decade ago, right when it was beginning, way before we ever had any live streams. What have been some of the biggest changes in, in how the sport operates? And some of the things that I'm thinking about are things like, you know, the money in the sport. You know, this is a huge opportunity to grow the sport, to compensate athletes for, you know, their, their performances and their training time. Um, you know, w what's the state of, of sort of that aspect of trail running and, you know, the, as aside from live streaming, you know, the coverage or publicity of the sport too. Gosh, that's a great question. And I'm pausing for a moment because I've only been in this sport for seven years. I got in, in late 2016. I think I'm coming up on my seventh anniversary in the sport. I wasn't even a runner before 2016. So I'd have to go back into the history books to, get a better sense of where the sport was at in 2013. I think what immediately comes to mind is, again, going back to what we talked about earlier, a lot of the stuff that is working in trail running right now and seems relatively avant-garde was actually taking place back in 2013 as well. Like some of the very first podcasters in any medium 
or in trail running. Like Ultra Runner Podcast comes to mind. Trail Runner Nation comes to mind. There were already these great shows that were doing fairly in-depth athlete interviews, race previews, recaps, stuff like that. I think maybe one of the biggest things that has changed, it's probably around the athlete side of things, is just the increasing percentage of athletes that are now going full-time on the sport or that are fully sponsored and it constitutes a pretty significant part of their living. So going back to the Western States 100, for example, I just saw a stat an hour ago showing that of the top 10 men and women finishers at the race on Saturday, 18 of them were sponsored, which I thought was very interesting. I think if you compared that number to 2013, I would ballpark it at probably 30, 40, 50%. Could be totally wrong there, but I, I think we've seen more and more athletes take a professional approach to the sport. Uh, a lot more of them go full time. I still think the number is relatively low, maybe in the 20 to 25% range that are doing this truly full time, like no coaching, no nine to five job, anything like that. But it's changing fast. Courtney DeWalter is a full-time athlete, does nothing else but run. Tom Evans, who won the race on the men's side, is full-time, does nothing else outside of this. You're seeing much more commitment to the sport. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. I think the media stuff, it's, I think we're really just building off a foundation that began about 10 years ago. The, the, a lot of the media infrastructure that we see today, with the exception of live streaming, was already in place we're kind of building off the backs of that. I Run Far pioneered a lot of that, you know, Twitter-based race coverage. I think maybe the jump we're trying to make in the modern era is just extending that type of breaking news, minute-to-minute, hour-to-hour updates to other social platforms because they've kind of self-contained themselves to Twitter. So, you know, bumping that to YouTube and to Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. But, uh, yeah, I, I would say the, the biggest change I notice is just the increasing number of athletes that are fully professional as opposed to sort of the stereotype back in the 2000s or the mid 2010s of these people that lived out of the back of their cars and eschewed, you know, modern adult responsibilities and, you know, were more closely related to like other animals than to like a a civilized human being or something like that. (laughs) Like we're, we're seeing people that now have nutritionists and, strength coaches. I mean, I I interviewed Tom Evans before Western States, and he said, I think it would surprise you that I now spend more time talking with a sports psychologist than I do my coach, my, 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 uh, my, you know, my running coach. So there are all these people now that are trying to pull that last one to two to three percent of potential out of themselves because they have the time and the money, and that certainly did not exist 10 years ago. Yeah, it's very similar to sort of the track or road racing world where, you know, a lot of the high level athletes surround themselves with, you know, this team of experts. It's it's the sports psychologist, it's the strength coach, it's the physical therapist, and of course the running coach. And they might have a, a crew of other high level athletes where, you know, they can train with and, and get that camaraderie from. And, and I think that trail and ultra running is sort of, you know, taking that step of professionalization from road racing and the track world and applying it to uh, the mountain ultra and trail world as well. And and we're seeing the results from that. It's just very clear that the performances are, you know, year to year, it just seems like the, the ultra performances are getting better and better and better. I mean, I don't think most events are seeing a one plus hour course record, you know, things like that. Like, it's just amazing the leaps and bounds improvement in the sport of ultra running. Do you think part of that is because a lot of runners who are are coming from that track and road racing background are now getting into trail running and sort of they they take that perhaps more methodical approach to their training that they might have taken for more of a middle distance event um, as opposed to just sort of like, you know, those, it's it's, it's very similar uh, to, you know, those climbers who live out of the van and they live in state in national parks and that's all they do is like free solo mountains and things like that. It, it's very similar to maybe a decade ago in the ultra world, but now we're actually seeing, you know, this professionalization and folks coming from more of a speed background. Do you think that's contributing as well? There are certainly some athletes in the sport who have a very rich, illustrious collegiate 
and professional road and track background. Interestingly enough, I just mentioned Tom Evans. Tom Evans has only been a runner for about five years. Granted, his he has this 20-plus year athletic base. He was in the military, the, the British military, for quite some time and did athletics through that, but did not have, from what I understand, uh, a very in-depth running background before that. Again, I could be wrong. I could be fact-checked on that. Sim- similar with Courtney DeWalter. She, she, she was a Nordic skier. I do think that what these people have in common is an appreciation for regimen and discipline and outsourcing a lot of the hard decision making to just like the facts and other people around them who are experts in micro fields in the sport. So going back to like the strength coach, just outsourcing decision making to like when to lift a coach like you, okay, this is the workout I'm doing today. Um, you know, uh, uh, psychologist, you know, okay, here's how I should think when the going gets tough mid-race. I, I think probably the unifying factor is just an appreciation for regimen and knowing that that will make the biggest difference once I am in this field of people who are pretty much just as good as me from like a genetics and a talent standpoint. I now have to really like exalt regimen in order to be the best. I have always found that no matter what type of runner you are, whether you're a middle distance runner, you're a hundred mile ultra marathoner, having a consistent schedule, that regimen that you were mentioning earlier is probably the key to success. You know, there's no secret to becoming a successful runner, but one of them might be having this consistent schedule and just approaching things with less of a loosey goosey a, you know, unstructured approach and instead being like, okay, I have a plan. I actually have some sort of structure that's going to allow me to get this progressive overload, to train in a strategic way, and then actually get the results that I'm looking for. Yeah. So, you know, even if you're not uh, an ultra marathoner, I think approaching your training in a bit more of a professional way in, in that manner is probably one of the best ways that you can really spark a lot of improvement within your own running. And to add to that, one of the notable coaches in our sport, Jason Coop, tells a famous story of how even just 10, 12 years ago, he had to beg the top athletes in the sport to get them to come under his program to coach them because they just didn't believe, they didn't see the benefits in coaching. Like he had, and now obviously everything for him is totally inbound and nearly every single elite athlete in the sport is under some sort of coaching program with some exceptions, few exceptions. But it's amazing that even 10 years ago in our sport, the top athletes, the Carl Meltzers, the Scott Jurics, the Chrissy Males, from what I understand, that was not a part of their pathway to being the best. Now it's a must. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Now thinking, you know, we're sort of like looking back with 2020 hindsight, you know, oh, of course, you need a coach. Of course, we need to get the word out and try to live stream this, these events. You know, th- this seems clear in hindsight. Maybe another thing that might seem like a no brainer, but that we're not doing right now is, you know, why doesn't running, whether we're talking about track or cross country or road racing or, or trail running, have some type of a league? There's no end of season tournament or championship like practically every other sport. Is it impossible? Why isn't there some type of conference and league or or sport championship at the end of the year? Something like that to get more publicity and more people excited about it. Certainly there are organizations that have tried or are trying currently. So UTMB, which is the race that I referenced out in Chamonix, France, without, without a doubt, it's the unofficial championship of ultra trail running like it has had no trouble in the last 10 years recruiting the the best athletes to go out there every august september to do battle and i think most athletes have seen that as as sort of the crown jewel in those 10 years as that race has grown it has had these international ambitions and what you're seeing now is something called the utmb world series and it's, tr- it's attempting to create this circuit where in order to run 
UTMB and its sister races, CCC and OCC, each August. You have to race into this series and get what are called stones, which are essentially like qualifying races to do UTMB in August. They're attempting to do that. There is pushback. Um, and I don't know why these things haven't taken shape. I think from a fan standpoint, it makes so much sense. From a entertainment product standpoint, it makes so much sense. And then even for athletes, I think it makes a lot of sense. But I think one of the, um, I'll call it a pro and a con of trail running, is that uh, it's just a very, very independent-minded sport. And people kind of like to do their own thing. And sometimes that leads to unity and sometimes it leads to chaos. And you have a lot of race directors that just want to have their own standalone race. Uh, some do want to be a part of this more collaborative effort, but there just isn't enough uni unification across the space for things to come together always. And, and that's why you have people like Jim Walmsley and Courtney DeWalter and Katie Shy, these, these top athletes not often on the same start lines. They totally pick their racing schedules independently. Sometimes they overlap. A lot of times they don't. Uh, there's a lot of forces at play. Sometimes it has to do with how their sponsors are incentivizing them to run. So they might put more, you know, bonus money on particular races. And that's why you'll see, you know, X runner at this race and Y runner over there. Sometimes it has to do with just like a passion project. Maybe they grew up in the area and that race means a lot to them, but otherwise it's like sort of like a nondescript, no name type race. Yeah, there, I, I think based on my observations in the last five or six years, it just comes down to this really interesting confluence of like strong-willed independence on the runner's part. And also probably the fact that until very recently, the only entities that have attempted to create leagues have been individual brands, which creates a natural problem because like if, if Hoka has a series, they're going to incentivize all of their runners to go to that race, but there isn't as much of an incentive for Solomon runners to go there. And by the same token, for Hoka runners to leave that web of races and to go elsewhere. So one of the, actually, one, one of the biggest problems that we're seeing especially in the last couple of years is sort of this caging of runners into these brand sponsored racing circuits. And so like Hoka runners are kind of like racing themselves. Solomon runners are racing themselves. Adidas runners are racing themselves. And I think that's a pretty big problem. Can we build teams based on the brand and then have those teams compete against one another at existing races so that we don't have to create a whole new circuit is that a viable strategy i, I guess i'm really just trying to take you know like my my uh, team sport background and try to apply it to the sport of running and it, it's so much more difficult than it seems I, certainly there have been these brand teams that have taken shape and Athletes get a lot of value out of them. So Adidas Terex, for example, has a very strong team culture, despite the fact that they're not co-located here in the trail running sphere. I know in the road running sphere, I'm very familiar with what Ben Rosario has done at Hoka Naz Elite in Flagstaff, Arizona. But I, I read an article maybe a year ago, or it was a blog by a guy named Peter Abraham. I kind of call him the Oracle of Endurance Sports because he just has all these great takes and he's kind of operating in the future and then bringing back all of these great insights to the present. And he has always maintained that endurance sports aren't that much different from a, as an entertainment product from baseball, basketball, and football. And one of the unifying themes that running uh, realms have to consider, road running, track, trail running, is if you're going to make a team, there has to be a geographic anchor. Like it has to be rooted first in a geographic anchor. It has to be, you know, the Salt Lake City something, I don't know what the mascot would be, or, you know, the Boulder something, you know, San Francisco something, as opposed to, like, the Hoka trail running team. Uh, I, I just think that in order to build fans, there has to be a geographic anchor there, and it can't be rooted in some sort of marketing campaign or, uh, you know, this operation to sell more apparel or to sell more gear. I just... And also, you know, as we know with brands, their identities change all the time. Their campaigns change all the time. 
you know, their, their logos and their colors and all that kind of stuff change all the time. So there's, there's too much fluidity. I also think in the brand space for fans and athletes to develop like a truly authentic connection there. And I think again, sports like football, basketball, baseball, they've all realized this and that's why they've always emphasized the, the regional component to it and all of the marketing and brand stuff has either been ancillary or very far back behind the scenes. I wonder if we can take a lesson from high school cross country and, you know, the Foot Locker cross country meet at the end of the season and how there are teams based on region. And so it, it's not necessarily about what high school you went to or even what state that you live in. It's really the region that you're in. And then you all come together as a regional group, compete against your other regional teams and you know do battle in that way you know maybe it's not four reason regions maybe it's five or six um but that might be an interesting opportunity to create that unity in the sport that i think is really important for its future growth i've also always felt that we should go on sort of a search and destroy mission to identify all of the wealthy benefactors that also happen to have a real interest and excitement in the running sphere and see if they could be the owners of these future teams so like the phil knights for example at nike like could we get them to bankroll these teams and then that way we can extricate ourselves from these brand first relationships i i just think that that's the pathway um i i don't think we have to reinvent the wheel compared to these other sports that have that have done it successfully let me ask you a kind of a weird question one of the things that I think brings a lot of team sports fans together and, and really creates some of the drama and excitement and rivalry is a little bit of healthy trash talking. Do you think there is not enough of this healthy trash talking in the sport of running? You know, and, and part of the reason why I ask is because, you know, there was this viral clip that was out on Twitter and Instagram maybe a couple months ago, and it was this sprinter who won a race did a very mild celebration in my view and then was disqualified and wasn't able to run at the state meet and, and to me it's just like we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot because we want everyone to be so accepting and you know we want to to put everyone up on a pedestal and you know i think there's a balance to be made between being inclusive and then also telling your competitor that you're going to bury them on the course in a good-natured way I think you just hit the nail on the head. I think you took the words out of my mouth. I probably would have described it the exact same way. Yeah, again, not to beat the drum again, but I, I, I come from a baseball, basketball, football background originally, and all of the trash talking and whatnot is endemic to the sport. It's just second nature. I don't think it's a bad thing. Certainly there have been examples in the past where people have taken it too far, but generally it's all good-natured, and it's positive and it creates sustainable drama around the sport and excitement. I don't know why it doesn't happen in running. I don't know if there's a cultural component to it. I don't know if there's just like a certain type of person that's attracted to it that doesn't carry that, uh, you know, theatrical component to themselves in their sporting lives. But um, I certainly miss it. I, I, I'm starting to see it more in track. Like I'm a big fan of Fred Curley. And I know Fred Curley is, you know, very much at the forefront of all that. And he's not afraid to kind of dig and, and take digs at some of his competitors and, and hype up upcoming races or even say things about races that have happened in the past. And with few exceptions, we have not had it in trail. Jim Walmsley earlier in his career, you know, Jim Walmsley has kind of since had this, I don't want to say personality transformation, but he's more, more mature. He's had this maturation process and he's not as aggressive or sort of upfront with some of his comments on the sport. Uh, but yeah, I, I miss it. That, that's, <laughs> that's definitely something that is, that's missing from the sport and some people, but I also, I also recognize that it's a controversial thing. Like there's a lot of people that say that this is what makes trail running so special that there's actually more, you know, kumbaya in the sport than there is in other sports. And we should do everything we can to preserve that. And at the same time, I don't have a great argument against that either, but I just know that all of my favorite sports to watch on a regular basis have that theatrical trash talking component to it as well. And the press conferences that are so entertaining and the players podcasts that, you know, are these very awesome 
look behind the curtains of, you know, athlete interactions and coaching interactions and agent, you know, owner team interactions. And that's all such a black box in the running realm. Uh, Yeah. I, I personally would like to see a little bit more of that. And, you know, I look to a sport like the UFC, which is obviously almost diametrically opposed to the sport of running, but one of the reasons why the UFC has just become this phenomenon is because of that drama. It's because they hold these contentious press conferences. And, and I don't think we need to go exactly the route of the UFC with that level of, of trash talking and, and almost vitriol in the, the uh, conversations between the athletes, but some level of you know, good-natured ribbing and things like that, I think is, is probably fun for everyone, uh, at least at the top, you know, where you want to see the drama. I don't know if, you know, everyone lining up who's going to finish a thousandth at the Boston Marathon, you know, something like that should be, you know, trash talking everyone else next to them in the corral. I don't know if that's the approach that we want, but certainly at the high level to draw in more people who are interested in those stories and those rivalries, Uh, I think would just be so exciting in the sport. The one other thing I'll add is something that I think running is missing for various reasons. But if you look at, again, sports like baseball, basketball, football, they all have players unions. And and we could have a totally separate conversation about whether or not unions are a good thing in terms of athlete empowerment and fair wages and stuff like that. But one thing undisputably that I think unions create that is great for fans is an off season that is worth commenting on because all of the contract negotiations and rates etc become public people like you and i who cover these sports have something to talk about fans have something to talk about we now have a greater sense of the pressures on athletes from a race to race basis from a training basis we understand how they're navigating their careers we can make inferences based on all that. We can create storylines based off that. There's this new narrative that now exists between the brand and the player, coach and the player, all that kind of stuff. Sports Center and a lot of these, you know, other pro sport related media companies, they do a lot of their business, a lot of their commentary, a lot of their talk shows, et cetera, not on, you know, what's happening from a game to game basis, but like on the off season and uh, in a lot of ways people are more interested in that off season stuff than they are in like individual performances during games in the playoffs it's just another layer of of drama and peeking behind the curtain and just understanding what's going on internally in an organization that i think everyone is really interested in you know i was reading that it's actually a survival mechanism among the human species to want to gossip to want to talk about little things and, you know, like who's, who's helping out in the village and who's not, because we may need to exile this person. <laughs> if they're not carrying their weight. And this kind of level of gossiping has served us well over our evolutionary history. Let's extend that to running. Let's extend a little bit of that drama and gossip. I think part of the solution, Finn, is just us. Uh, when we do talk to some of these pro runners and have them on our different media properties and talk about these things, we need to be encouraging them to to trash talk and to <laughs> and you know to have more of this uh, drama filled training and and pre race lead up. I think that's part of our responsibility. <laughs> I agree. Although I will say, um, now being on the other side of the microphone, I realize how difficult it can be to. Uh, go to like your first opinion and, and, and publicly state that. And so I now like have now being on this side of the mic, I have a much deeper appreciation for athletes being hesitant to go on the record about certain things or, you know, m- think in controversial terms. So, um, but yeah, I agree. I think the more we can facilitate that kind of dialogue and also that kind of dialogue without too much, if any retribution, in terms of like relationships with sponsors or other athletes, um, I think it's all good. Yeah, and of, of course it goes without saying that any sort of trash talking or creation of drama always has to be mostly respectful and in good fun and only as a way to increase that competitive fire between people. Um, One more thing I'll add to that. we So we did a bunch of pre-race interviews for Western States and one of the athletes we had on, his name's Jeff Colt, he was pretty forward about his ambitions at Western States. He's like, I'm not here just to finish the race. I'm not here just to top 10. No, I'm here to get on that podium. I'm here to win the race. And 
we put that clip out on social media to help promote the episode. And lo and behold, it was the most popular episode of any of the 10 or 15. We did more popular than the Courtney episode. And I think it, be, it was because his approach to the race and his comments on the race were so novel. Of course, every single athlete is probably thinking in those terms privately, but he was willing to go on the record to call his shot and to get on the start line that Saturday, knowing that everyone in the field was aware of what he said. And it was a total game changer. So there's definitely a hunger for it among fans. And uh, it's cool that he kind of put himself out there like that. Yeah, for sure. It's it's sort of like thinking, you know, every sport has fans of the sport and and they they thrive off that type of content. And there just needs to be a little bit more of it in the sport of running. Uh, I think it's going to grow, but I'm curious to hear what you think. You know, if you could look into a crystal ball, how do you think the sport of, of ultra and trail running will grow and evolve over, say, the next decade? What are, what are you most excited about? I think we've laid the foundations really well with live streams because I think, how do I put this? Well, I think I, think I want to restart that answer. I think we're doing a lot of things already pretty well that may not have immediate returns, but will have outsized returns five or 10 years from now, the live stream being one of them. So we're in the process of putting together the playbook for what a good live stream looks like. And as soon as these broadband issues are resolved, we're gonna be waiting in the wings with this awesome product when it comes to commentary and storytelling and all of the right frames and shots to put it together. That's all gonna be waiting in the wings to just totally be nailed. I think the one outstanding question, in my opinion, is how do we attract people that will never run an ultra marathon to be fans of it? That's the question that I don't have the answer to. But I, because I, I think, I think over the next five to ten years, we're naturally going to bring in all of the people that do ultra marathons that they will gravitate towards the product of like viewing these races and enjoying that too. But, uh, there's this great article that I'll, I'll send to you. Maybe we can link to it in the show notes, but it's, uh, by this guy named Fred Abramowitz, who's the race director for the run rabbit run 100 out in steamboat Springs, Colorado. And it's called a blueprint for the sponsorship and growth of ultra running. And he talks about fans of the sport and concentric rings and we've done this great job of catering to the to the super fans of the sport and creating a viewing and uh, content experience catered towards them but we haven't yet reached the outer rings of the concentric circle and catered to people that uh, are just sports fans in general and I haven't studied this enough I, I, I admittedly I have not studied this enough I, I am very curious to know what these other major sports have done to recruit fans that don't play the sport. That the, the answer to how the sport will grow in 10 years will be the answer to that question. What can we, how do we attract people to watch the Western States 100, the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc that have no intentions of ever playing the sport, but they will consume it and they'll be avid fans and they will somehow identify with Jim Walmsley and Courtney DeWalter and, you know, place bets on the sport and follow it and, uh, and per per purchase product off of it and advertisers find it, you know, even more attractive. I think that's the central question. I, I don't know the answer though. I think it's, it's, uh, it's part of what I have used my podcast for over the past two years to try to find the answer to. And, uh, I think we're still working on it. I think there's a lot of these small micro components that add up to the answer. Like we talked about the live stream technology. We talked about professional teams. We talked about, enabling more athletes to go pro. I think when you solve those micro problems and then you add them all up, maybe that's part of the answer. Yeah. I'm curious too, if part of the answer is, is simply communicating to the wider public, the, the folks who are never going to run an ultra, just how difficult some of these races are and, and sort of painting it as look, they're just not going for a jog like out on a trail somewhere. This, they, they are going to battle. This is a war. And if, if we look at how football is framed or UFC fights are framed, you know, they are doing something so incredible that's put on a pedestal. And I think we should probably do a better job of 
really putting these performances into context and, you know, just even like talking about Courtney DeWalter's performance and saying like, you know, she ran kind of like a 355 marathon four times in a row on gnarly terrain, um, you know, in the heat at altitude with all these elevation changes and really drilling down into the amazing, incredible performance that this was and communicating how this is not something that you see every day or every year. It is really, truly something special. That's a great point. The only thing I would potentially push back on, and this is, I, I follow Michael Johnson. I don't know if you follow him as well on, on uh, Twitter, the former sprinter. He did recently have a, a tweet thread about growth in the sport, I believe, that, that got pretty popular. Yeah, and he, and, he, and he talks about, and this just kind of got the wheels spinning in my head, he talked a bit about how historically in track and field we've been over fixated on times and individual performances and less on competition, and that needs to be reversed. He, he says we need to way more emphasize, you know, pure competition and all of the dynamics between racers and less on like, oh, you know, they ran you know, 144 in the 800 yesterday, and, you know, we should create a spectacle out of that. He's, he very much says we got to bring it back to the competition piece, and, I, you know, I think that's part of the constellation. It's like you talked about the trash talking earlier. There's, there's got to be some of that. There's got to be more coverage and reporting and media and emphasis around, you know, the dynamics between all the racers there in the field and maybe less on times, and maybe that's part of the answer, too. We've just been people like me, maybe pe maybe part of the problem is people like me have been focusing way too much on the numbers and less on the competitive dynamics. Yeah, I don't think there's any one right answer here. You know, like you were saying, we've sort of created this foundation. And, and I think that foundation is really going to provide a lot of uh, really great things as soon as the technology catches up, as soon as you know the sport has a little bit more money and can spend more and invest more in the sport itself but yeah i think it, probably the number one thing that we could all do is is that focus on competition and, and that i think is ultimately a human story that is a team versus a team an individual versus an individual you know this is like you know the famous chicago bulls versus the boston celtics in basketball in in the 90s larry bird versus magic johnson i mean we've got to have those amazing personalities and stories that are going to drive viewership um and it's not about how many points they scored in the game although it can certainly be part of that equation i'll say one more thing and again this is probably like a cliche response but i also think storytelling is so key one of the most popular live streams that I've ever been a part of is a race called the Cocodona 250, which starts just north of Phoenix, Arizona, and it finishes in downtown Flagstaff, Arizona. It's a point-to-point -point race. It's a pretty niche race. It's put on by that Aravipa running company that I mentioned. Very niche. 200-mile races in and of themselves are very niche. And we had done commentary for much more, you would think, popular races in our sport. And yet, this race in terms of viewership on our YouTube live streams blew the doors off of like golden ticket races for the Western States 100, for example, because there was so much storytelling involved. Like there was this runner in the race, his name's Eric Sensman, very strong runner. He's gotten a lot of golden tickets to Western States in the past. He trains with Jim Walmsley in Flagstaff, just a great runner. And there was this whole story heading into the race about how you know, after all of this success in lower distance ultras, he was going to go and give the 250 mile race a try. And it actually like totally backfired on him and it stripped him bare. And he ended up finishing middle of the pack. And it, it was sort of this great equalizer distance between him and these other people that specialize in it. And people were so attracted to that story. The same thing with Sally McRae. She was in this year's race. She brought a lot of attention to it. And so I think storytelling is so key, like really emphasizing the narratives that are driving these athletes to get to get to the start line and then to see whether or not those narratives end up playing out during the race or if, the, or if there's this total change in how things play out. So um, I, I have been shocked at how the distance can be sometimes irrelevant and how much storytelling plays a role in all this. 
Yeah, well, before we wrap, Finn, I, I want to acknowledge you for, for exactly that. You know, I think the coverage and the inspiration and the storytelling that you're doing uh, at the Single Track Podcast is just awesome. And I think it's getting the next generation of trail runners excited about the sport. So, you know, thanks for your time today, but also just thanks for what you do for the sport of trail running. Appreciate you so much. Yeah, thanks for the shout out. And we're certainly trying our best. And uh, I think to bring it back to that whole infinite game concept, I think uh, it's pretty liberating to set the time horizon at, you know, whatever. And there's you just you just do your best with the time you're given. And I think that's what we're uh, how we're thinking about it. Yeah. So single track podcast that's probably the best place to find you and your work do you want to point anyone to other places on the interwebs we still need to build our digital home so tbd on the website i would uh we're, we're we are at run single track on all platforms so youtube instagram twitter etc go find us there i would say we're most active on instagram and youtube and then we're just the single track podcast on all of the audio players and you can uh, see my face in the uh, in the podcast thumbnail uh, to find the right one yeah well you've shaved so it's a little bit of a different face (laughs) 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 all right Phil well thanks so much for your time man appreciate it appreciate you